Before we get to Dayton though, I wanted to have a conversation about just some of the big picture lessons we can learn from free agency as it applies to the NFL at large, what some of these signings mean, what they mean for certain positions. Obviously, we spent all week last week reacting to these things in real time and trying to give some input about what those signings meant for the teams. But now that we have some distance from it, I wanted to zoom out and chat about some big picture lessons. And the person I wanted to have this discussion with is someone who's done a phenomenal job of breaking down all things free agency over at PFF. And that is the salary cap analyst for Pro Football Focus. It's Brad Spielberger. Brad, how you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic. How you doing? I'm doing very, very well. You and I have been talking about a lot of these signings privately over the last week or so, because if people don't know, you're also a Bears fan. And I think that you and I have been more plugged into this off season than we've probably been to any off season for like three years because <laughs> the stakes are real again. So I figured it was just time to have that conversation that we were having in private and just bring it to a public forum as we took a step back and chatted about what free agency can teach us here. Yeah, just convert uh, the DMs into a podcast. I think it's a great <laughs> idea. And actually, I'm excited to hear what Dane says. I think the biggest thing, and we'll get into it a little bit, but uh, the kind of the thing people need to understand more and more is the relatedness between free agency and the draft. We learned so many lessons from that first week. Uh, so I'm excited to hear what he has to say. So let's dig into this. Uh, the first question I want to ask you, and we can go a bunch of different directions. I'm sure there'll be a bunch of answers to this. But as you look at the contracts handed out over the last two weeks, which deals do you think have told us the most about the landscape of the NFL? Yeah, so so the league at large, I think you are just seeing the continued growth of the interior of both trench units. So first, obviously, <laughs> those defensive tackles, we obviously had some some indications, but I do think the big thing that happened this offseason was Aaron Donald, shout out to the legend, th thanks for everything, Aaron, uh, you know, ha had this outlier deal that was so off in the stratosphere in its own tier above 30 million. And every player besides him was 22, 23, 24. Even Justin Matibike gets 24 and a half this offseason in terms of average annual value. And then Chris Jones, you know, Kool-Aid man kicks the door open and says, no, I'm in that Aaron Donald tier as well. Like, don't get it twisted. And then Christian Wilkins was able to split the gap. So it's just the continued evolution of that position's like it rivals or it's close to rivaling the edge rushers. If you can rush the pass around the interior, you are you're a pass rusher and you're going to get paid like it. What do you think led to that market expanding in that way? Is it simply an Aaron Donald effect? Is it about availability of those players with certain avenues in the NFL? Why do you think that moment has come now? Yeah, so it's twofold. First, I think it is just how they are deployed in the NFL and the way they are viewed. Obviously, we've had three technique pass rusher types, but I think you did see kind of a an overall philosophy of you stop the run with those guys between the tackles and you rush the passer with the edge rushers. And obviously that has changed over time. But I also think the second point there is key. Uh, we, we've, I've written about this a bunch where we talk about premium positions a lot. And I don't think defensive tackle over the last couple of years, if you ask people, they probably would say edge tackle receiver. Maybe they would say corner, which we'll talk about a little bit later, too. To me, defensive tackle, because of the scarcity of available talent, and the, the big thing for me is, A, go look at the list of the 15 highest paid defensive tackles. There's like one or two guys that are not first round picks. And then also just go into free agency every year. And obviously, we've talked about, you know, Christian Wilkins, but it's just you don't find a lot of premier talent um, that hits the actual open market. Whereas we've gotten like your Daniel Hunters, your Jonathan Grenards, like your Bryce Huffs, like those guys do seem to make it more often. So I think that is the big thing is just it's hard to find those dudes if you don't draft them or trade a bunch for them uh, or what have you. And even if you look at Christian Wilkins hitting free agency specifically, that's a unique case just because of where Miami is in their team building process. So even he feels like an outlier. And I think it's a really good way to think about how premium positions are becoming defined around the NFL, because as somebody who really does a lot of work and has a lot of conversations about the schematic impact of these guys, that's how that's the first place my brain goes. A premium position is somebody who can flip the math in one way or another as you're trying to plan who you want to be on offense or defense. But the market and availability also plays a role here. And if all of these guys are never going to hit free agency, then suddenly they become premium positions because of scarcity and because of how much you have to pay them. And then the way that the market starts creeping up and up and up is these outliers become normal, whether it's Chris Jones or Aaron Donald. And then if you can get one of them, if one of them can sneak out 
of that team control and into free agency, then those markets are going to be pushed up. Like, how pissed off do you think Justin Matabike is that he signed his deal five days before Christian Wilkins did? But now the next guy in line is going to be very happy that Christian Wilkins ended up getting to the market. And the cool thing about Wilkins that you touched on there, the football side, he is a guy where, like on early downs, you can like, his presence can enable you to put an extra back seven defender on the field, right? You can play nickel or big nickel or dime because he can two gap, he can do everything. The guy plays like 900 snaps a season too. So you know, I think some people say, "Oh, he's not a premier pass rusher." This year he was great. He doubled his career high in pressures for us. Had a bunch of sacks, but. Yeah, but the calculus, he changes like you're talking about. Schematically on early downs, the presence of Christian Wilkins changes what the 10 other players are doing on your defense. And I think there's a lot of guys you could say that about. I mean, obviously, Dexter Lawrence has phenomenal pass rush production, but what he can do in the middle of a defense. And a credit goes to Eric Eager, who I think two or three years ago was writing about this per PFF, just in the shifting value of interior defensive linemen as the league got lighter in terms of box counts and what you were doing at linebacker. So I think we're starting to finally see the full on wide ranging impact of that. And as that happens on defense, We've almost seen a market meeting it on offense, like you alluded to. We have guys like Robert Hunt getting $20 million a year. Damian Lewis got a nice deal from the Panthers as well. Jonah Jackson got paid. I, I think the, the canary in the coal mine was the Kevin Dotson deal at $17 million before the market even opened. So as you've watched the guard market explode, is it as simple to you as, well, if these guys on the other side are getting paid $25 million, shouldn't the guys tasked with blocking them one-on-one -on -one start to get paid a little more as well? It's a very, very common agent spin, and it's, it should be, right? That's that's them doing their job. You hear it all the time. They literally say, I'm going to go in and tell the team, if my guy's doing a good job of battling these players and their market is spiking, why would not? Why would the, you know, the, the opposing position not have the same effect? So I, I think it's, it's certainly a big, big part of it, and I think it is. It's, it's like it's legit. I, I think it's real. I think it should be reflected in that way. If you do you think there are other market forces too, though? Do you, do you think that's it, or do you think there are other things at play here? I'm curious because I haven't necessarily landed on anything, but you think about this in a much more critical way than I do. I think it, that is the biggest one, I, I will say. Just like what they're tasked with is, again, like the same principle where maybe they were only asked to be good run blockers, but they could be weak in pass pro, you know, historically. Now you can't. You have to also handle these 285-pound three-technique Aaron Donald freaks of nature and then also – be able to, you know, get off a combo block against a 350 pound nose tackle and get to the second level and climb as a run blocker. So I really think that is like it's a, it's a fair question. And we can get into the market a little bit, too, and the, the mid tier growing, not just the top, which I think is a different conversation. But I think just at a high level, it really is just, yeah, the guys we're going against are more scheme diverse, skill set diverse. And it's a bigger challenge. I wonder if the scarcity element of this has a chilling effect over the next few years, though, because guard is an exception to what we talked about with defensive tackle. If you look at the highest paid guards in the league, some of them are first round picks like Chris Lindstrom is. Landon Dickerson was drafted fairly high, but these guys are a lot of second round picks. Jonah Jackson was a third round pick. Kevin Dotson was a fourth round pick. Wyatt Teller bounced around the league. Ben Powers got paid a lot of money as a mid round pick. So it does feel like there are more avenues to find guys at this position. So I wonder if there's going to be some sort of downstream effect later where teams don't feel like they have to overpay for guys to get starting level play at that spot specifically. It's great you mentioned that because I want to say five or six off seasons ago, we had a similar thing where the guard market just popped. So like a bunch of dudes got paid. Some that made sense that, you know, like Zach Martin, for example, I think was in that year. Like obviously he's going to get there. Um, but, but a bunch of other guys kind of also were able to cash in fairly strongly. And the next couple of years, it was the opposite. There was a, a kind of a correction, like you said, kind of a chilling effect of, okay, this wasn't the greatest idea. And, and that ties into, I won't get super contract nerdy for the most part, but, but I do think a fascinating thing here is, Different position markets we've seen try to go for shorter and shorter deals. And obviously, you know this now, but I, I want to stress this like the fans more. I think because of baseball and basketball, we think longer equals better when it comes to contracts. In the NFL, that is not true. Almost 90% of the time, you want to get back to the market faster because everything's rising, because things are not guaranteed outside of the second, maybe third year. The guard market had been one where it was so hard to sign those short-term deals. We've seen receivers. They all have three-year deals now, You know, insert position, whatever. Guards, it was always four or five. And so you mentioned Kevin Dotson and then also Jonah Jackson for the same team. But then Mike Onwenu, who I know might play right tackle, but still 
all those guys got those three-year deals, that shorter term. I think that was a bigger win even than some of the actual money. It just We're also going to match that short market, get back to the market because guard might continue to spike or, like you said, it, it might have a downturn, but either way. So you think that's solely a product of having leverage in negotiations beyond the AAV growing? That's also just a sign that the position is being valued more? I would say so, yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I do wonder it, when when and if that bubble bursts because Robert Hunt, while a solid player, $20 million a year for Robert Hunt is a very big premium that you're paying. And I just don't think that really applies to the types of players that you're paying at defensive tackle because there aren't a lot of like second tier guys hitting the market to overpay. And that's also something I, I think receiver has been similar and we could talk about this. It almost feels like the lack of available players has saved teams from themselves when it comes to the receiver market, because there haven't even been guys that you're willing to overpay because so few of them are hitting the market overall. I think it's a great point. I, and I think just real quick at the last, put a bow on the guard thing, tackles, their, their markets have been lagging. So once Tristan Wirfs and Panay Sewell are making like $30 million a year, then maybe teams will say, okay, we're going to pay guards less because tackles are back on the upswing. But yeah, the receiver, it's, it's a good point, right? If there were more like good but not great type of guys, they probably would be getting Calvin Ridley-esque contracts. But he got it because he was kind of the only Calvin Ridley-tier player. A very good player, no question about it. But he's not on anyone's top 15 receivers list. I, you know, So, so like, you're right. There's just not that many of those guys available. Joining us now, it is the athletics draft expert. It's Dane Brugler. Dane, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing very well. I wanted to do this with you because when I was looking back at free agency, I wanted to talk about what we learned on the NFL side from free agency. But I also think that free agency inevitably impacts the draft and it shapes what teams need, which directions teams might go. So I also wanted to have a discussion with you now that, you know, we're halfway through free agency. The first major waves are done. Most of the dominoes have fallen. I think that the draft mock drafts where teams are going to go in which direction has crystallized a little bit more than it probably would have been two weeks ago so this feels like a good time to revisit the way that you're thinking about certain teams and how they might approach draft weekend in a lot of ways it becomes tougher to do a mock draft because i think for a lot of teams the goal is fill your needs in free agency and that mm -hmm. frees you up to do whatever you want on draft day especially in that first round if you have options and you want to maybe pivot and go in a different direction, you can because you're not tied to a certain position. And so free agency, I think that's a good way to put it, definitely crystallizes how a lot of teams are, are what they're looking at. But at the same time, it does make it more difficult too as we try to project what positions these teams are trying to zero in on. Which teams over the past week have changed your view of them and their draft strategy the most? Um, maybe the, maybe the bears with that ninth pick, uh, obviously, you know, quarterback's going to be the, the first pick, uh, but that ninth pick was always interesting. And I know I, I was captain trade up. I get them one of those top three receivers and let, let's go have fun. But adding Keenan Allen, um, which obviously wasn't a free agent thing, but it was a trade thing. It's a, it's a big addition. I don't, a lot of us didn't see that coming. Um, felt like Keenan Allen was going to stay put. But and, and kudos to Ryan Poles for making that happen. Now, okay, if one of those receivers does fall to nine, which still feels unlikely, but it's possible. If it does happen, would they still draft the receiver, or are they going in a different direction? You know, they're bringing in Dallas Turner, the Alabama pass rusher, for a thirty visit. Um, I think above all, that move it gives Poles the freedom to trade back and really get more picks. I think that's the thing with this move that. The, the first thought that came to my mind more than anything else, a team, even if they're looking to maybe a team looking to get a tackle, trade up a few spots to get in front of the Jets or one of these other teams. Maybe a team really wants that first corner, whether it's Quinion Mitchell from Toledo or uh, Terry on Arnold from Alabama, even if they're trading back three, four spots, uh, if the bears can b get back an extra third, I think that's something that will be at the top of the priority list for polls. If he can make it happen. They don't have many picks at all. I mean, you look at what they've traded away. They traded a fourth for Keenan Allen. They traded a fifth for Ryan Bates. They traded a second for Montez Sweat. So they really have their third round pick and not much else because they traded away those six and their sixth and seventh and smaller deals over the last year as well. And that's not typically how he's operated. I mean, they've stockpiled picks for the most part in the first two drafts. So I wouldn't be surprised by that at all. And I think the thought process with the Keenan Allen thing is right, where you're not sure if one of those receivers is going to fall to you. You don't want to be put in a spot where you're desperate to find one. You want to give yourself flexibility. And I think that that's what a lot of teams have tried to do 
even in this range of the draft, the other team I was going to ask you about, I assume you just had a tackle or an offensive lineman mocked to the Jets and everything that you've been doing over the last several months. Right. And now the Jets hammered offensive line early and often in free agency. They have three new presumptive starters now with Morgan Moses, John Simpson, and Tyron Smith there. So what do you think about the Jets and how that might pivot their strategy come draft day? Well, look, no GM knows better than Joe Douglas that there's no such thing as having too much depth on the offensive line. So <laughs> I, in no way am I discounting offensive tackle at 10. Yeah. Just just for you know, needs purpose. I mean, look, Tyron Smith and Mo, uh, Morgan Moses are both over 33. Um, Tyron, he has not played more than 13 games in a season in eight years. So and the 13 it, is an outlier. The 13 last year was actually much more than he's played right. in any season over the last five years. So even 13 was better than you could probably expect. I, I will say this though. I, I, they really like that second year tackle from Pitt, uh, Carter Warren, who they drafted mm -hmm. last year. Um, they think he's a really quality backup who could be a future starter. Max Mitchell's still there uh, as kind of a swing guy. He provides some depth. Um, this pick is at number 10 for the Jets. It's going to be offense. I mean, it has to be. Anything else would be a shock. So if it's not offensive line, the player that really makes the most sense is Brock Bowers. And look, he he makes the Jets offense better from day one. And my very first mock back in Thanksgiving, I put Bowers to the Jets and definitely a mixed reaction from fans. Uh, but I think this is interesting because one of the comps, you know, when you watch players, prospects, you write down a bunch of names as uh, at least shows a little bit of this player. Try to come up with good comparisons. One of the names I wrote down for Bowers was Julius Thomas. Uh, who did Nathaniel Hackett have back in Jacksonville? Thomas, who they signed to a good-sized contract. Oh, they, so They sure I, did. That's when they were spending money on everybody. Yeah, right. And, you know, I, I don't know that it necessarily worked out, but uh, it, it was someone they, they felt like, okay, this is going to be someone that we can center our offense around. And with Bowers, he's – He's more of a slot than a true wide tight end, and but that's okay because I mean, who's the starting slot right now for the Jets? I, I mean, I, I don't know Gibson, that probably right, I mean, that, right, that's exactly. What you're looking at, and if you look at the how that would kind of synergize with the skill sets that Garrett Wilson and Mike Williams have, I actually like that mm -hmm. a lot. I actually think that makes yeah. a ton of sense for them, probably more than almost any other team that's picking in that range. Anybody else, maybe in the first half of the first round or even beyond that, where you had what you thought was a set of needs for them that has really shifted over the last week or so? Well, I think we, we have to mention uh, the Titans, you know, that Calvin Ridley uh, contract coming in. Um, you know, Rain Carthon, in his, now in his second year as GM, has, he, he said that he wanted – they needed to get more weapons. They needed to get more dynamic on offense, and Ridley helps them do that. I, it feels like a wide receiver now at number seven is probably unlikely. I mean, you never rule it out, but – it's always been offensive tackle there. That's kind of, it's al it's almost makes too much sense for it to happen, especially if Joe Alt from Notre Dame is there. But it feels like, okay, yeah, could have been maybe Bowers, maybe one of these receivers, but now it feels like, okay, this is going to be Joe Alt. Um, you know, the Chiefs, I, I think this is – the Chiefs are interesting because you bring in Hollywood Brown. Um, obviously, it's just a one-year deal, but how does that signing change their thinking? Uh, you know, last year with the last pick in the first round, they went – um, uh, Uzama from Kansas State, pass rusher who was more of a draft and develop type of pick. It wasn't someone like, okay, we need to fill this need immediately and he's going to play a big part for our defense. No, he was a guy that they can draft and develop. They could still do a, pick a receiver at 32, someone to draft and de develop, but adding a Hollywood Brown certainly gives them options and it's no longer, okay, let's make sure we're giving the Chiefs the receiver that's, you know, Patrick Mahomes needs for so they can compete for that third straight title. And we've talked about this a little bit, me and Nate, just that Marquise Brown's skill set within that offense, you still kind of need a bigger bodied outside receiver mm -hmm. that's going to fill that role a little more traditionally than anybody they have on the roster right now. So that wouldn't surprise me at all. Is there any team after free agency or this first wave of free agency has ended that has left a need that you think make their draft priorities even clearer than they might have been a couple weeks ago? I mean, for me, the, the team that is kind of blinking in red lights here for this question uh, is the Cowboys. Uh, the quietest team in free agency. Obviously, there's going to be a reshuffling on that offensive line with Tyron Smith gone, Tyler Biotish gone at center. Um, based on you know my talks with uh, you know, people in Dallas, it's they're fine with moving Tyler Smith from left guard to left tackle. 
TJ Bass starting at left guard, and then Brock Hoffman starting at center. I that if they had to play a game tomorrow, that's what they're doing, and I think they'd be okay with that. Uh, much to the chagrin of right. uh, Cowboys fans, right? Exactly. So, but obviously they're going to address these positions in some way in the draft. Um, what? I, and I think it, the Cowboys are interesting because we, I think we know which positions they're going to address. We just don't know the order. Like they're going mm-hmm. to draft a tackle. They're going to draft a center. Are they going to do that for second round? Are they going to do it third, fourth round? We just, it's hard to peg down exactly how they're going to do it. And, and a lot of it will depend on how the board falls to them picking at 24th in the first round. Um, you know, if a Tyler Guyton from Oklahoma uh, is their offensive tackle, I think it's a good bet that's the pick, uh, especially because this is a strong center class. They feel really good about the centers in rounds two, three, and four, someone they can get that's going to add immediate competition uh, for the starting center job. And that's what they did with, I mean, Tyler Biotish was that type of pick, uh, mm-hmm. you know, four years ago. So I think they feel fourth comfortable. Fourth round pick, right? Uh, fourth or fifth, yeah. And, and yeah. so I think they feel fine going in that direction again. Uh, but then also running backs part of this too, with uh, mm-hmm. Pollard no longer there. I mean, right now, Rico Dowdle is the starter. And I, I've mentioned this before, but I think Jonathan Brooks, the Texas running back in the second round, that's the name to watch. Um, but running back is a position that third round, fourth round, there's going to be plenty of options. And um, so again, I think the Cowboys are a team where their their needs and what the directions are going to go in the draft, I think are very predictable, but the order of which the priorities, that's where we're kind of left guessing at this point. We've talked a lot about the top guys at center, Jackson Powers, Johnson, Graham Barton from Duke, mm-hmm. the guy from uh, West Virginia, whose name is Zach Frazier right now, yep. Zach Frazier, who also is projected to be a potential late first round pick. Who are some of those guys maybe outside of the top 40, 50 that you think can be contributors on the interior for somebody? Uh, Tanner Bordellini from Wisconsin. Um, sounds like a, a dish you probably ate at an Italian restaurant. Yeah, once. I, lo- um, I love that. Yeah. He, uh, he killed the combine. I mean, you see the movement skills, uh, fantastic, uh, in terms of the athleticism, he's going to be a guy. And obviously the, the Cowboys have had good luck with Wisconsin centers. Um, Bo Limmer from Arkansas is another one. Once you get to the third round, um, Cedric Van Pran, Georgia, Hunter Norzad from Penn state. Uh, there's legitimately, uh, five, six guys in this draft that you think can be NFL starters and guys that will compete for starting reps. And so those three guys at the top are, uh, so there are going to be some interesting discussions about, okay, how early do we feel comfortable taking one of these players? I think Graham Barton, even though he's coming off injury, might be the safest just because he can do so much. The versatility is so appealing with him. Um, and, and then Jackson Powers Johnson, he's got his own injury stuff, but uh, coming off one year at Oregon, he was so good on tape. I'm, I'm still trying to find the bad tape for, for him. Uh, and then Zach Frazier, another guy coming off injury, but he's a four-year starter, wrestling background, kind of the quintessential center for what a lot of teams are looking for. So, yeah, if, this is a really good center class, and the Cowboys will be coming away from this draft uh, with one of those guys that we probably just mentioned. Two teams I also wanted to mention here and ask you about. The Patriots obviously are positioned to draft a quarterback. We know that. But they haven't been very aggressive in adding pieces in free agency. And that's understandable. You know, they're still in stage one of this thing as they completely retool the roster. But now they're going into the draft with so many holes that I think it's going to be difficult to justify dropping a rookie quarterback into that situation and feeling decent about it. Because you're walking into an offense that has... Kendrick Bourne, KJ Osborne, and Demario Douglas, and Juju Smith Schuster as your four receivers. It, they're all like, they all exist in a certain class of, of, of pass catching talent, right? If you're looking at that group as a whole. That's whole. fair. And yeah. then the offensive line still has several holes on it. Like this is a team that still needs a left tackle. So if you if you look at the way that New England has approached free agency, including going to get Jacoby Brissett, would you say that their haul and their approach makes it more or less likely? for them to stick at three and draft a quarterback or try to trade back and accumulate some pieces. Yeah. I mean, I think on the surface, this is a team that needs picks uh, They because they need players. They need to build. Um, but at the same time, it, it's all about getting the quarterback right. And if you fall in love with one of these quarterbacks, then that has to be the pick at three. And again, we've mentioned this before, but this is an ownership pick. It really doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about these quarterbacks in the organization if Robert Kraft wants a quarterback they're drafting a quarterback and so uh, maybe that depends on who goes to assuming Caleb Williams is the pick to the Bears at one the commanders I was talking to people this morning still trying to see if there's any updates on 
Uh, if the commanders are tipping their hand, they're, they're not. They're going through the same motions with Drake May as they are with Jaden Daniels in terms of the meetings and all of that. So, uh, and, and predictably, they're, you know, they're doing their homework, even if in their mind they know who they're going to draft it to. Um, but that might influence what the Patriots do at three. There, there's no guarantee. I think, you know, in, in a vacuum, we think about these quarterbacks like, okay, one, two, three, whoever's the third quarterback, that's just, you know, the Patriots will obviously like that third quarterback. And that's not always the case. This yeah. might be a two quarterback class for them. So time will tell on that. But bottom line, if you love one of these quarterbacks, even if the roster isn't set up ideally for what you want, I still feel like you have to do it. You have to pull the trigger because you just don't know when you're going to be drafting this early again. But again, that's assuming that the quarterback at three is who they want. If it's not, then they'll have suitors to move back. And I'm, um, you know, the getting that the the all those picks, getting the the return is something that they need, and something that you know Elliot Wolf would love to have to really build this roster the way he wants to do it. The other one that jumped out to me, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday with me, you and Nate just discussing teams that might be willing to trade up for a wide receiver. The Steelers now have a very real need at receiver that they did not oh. two weeks ago before trading Deontay Johnson. So that's a team where the way that the draft lines up, you could easily see them drafting a receiver in the first round or very high in a way you probably couldn't have 10 days ago. With all due respect to Van Jefferson, yes, 100%. This is a, <laughs> a, 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 an, a, this is a team that needs more, especially with, uh, you know, a quarterback with russell wilson uh you know he he's gonna rely on his guys to get open and uh they need some more help there and if is that something they want to do in the first round is this is a th they've met multiple times with ricky pearsall from florida a few of these other run, uh, receivers that are going to be in that second round so it feels like somewhere in the first three rounds they're going to draft a receiver it just depends on is the right one available first round second round third round in terms of when they actually pull that trigger yeah Stepping away from the teams and looking at the positions more so, which positions in this draft do you think were helped by the way free agency unfolded, just creating a need for guys at those spots? I, I think you look at you look at wide receiver and tackle the for on a larger scale, and you think about the receivers that were available this off season. You think about the tackles that were available this off season. Uh, not a lot of high price guys, Pro Bowl level players. And I think it's a kind of a clear message for these teams saying, hey, if we have a really good tackle, a really good receiver, we're not letting them leave. You know, T. Higgins, you're not, we're not going to give you away for nothing. Um, but it also matches up with the strengths of this draft. There will be more wide receivers and offensive tackles drafted in the first round this year than any other position. And it's, it's just a really interesting uh, way. And I don't know that one affects the other. It's just kind of how it's worked out in this particular draft and this offseason. But I think it does speak to the larger point that, hey, if teams have one of these guys, the tackle or receiver that they feel is a Pro Bowl of a player, they're just not letting them go. You look at the market at receiver, and I guess you could throw Jerry Judy into this as well, just because he got an extension off of a trade. So if you take Jerry Judy, Calvin Ridley, Darnell Mooney, and Gabe Davis, those are the only guys that sign new contracts this offseason for more than $10 million a year, which that $10 million threshold is probably what I would say is a full-time starting receiver contract in the NFL. Right? And how many of those There's were over 1,000 yards receiving last year? I think of those four. Ridley, right? I think, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. It probably just would have been Ridley. So even that number mm -hmm. is getting pumped up a little bit. So you have four starting level receivers who were available on the market this year. Four. That's it. And even those That's guys crazy. are further down the line with number twos. I mean, Nate, Darrell Mooney signs at Atlanta. He still thinks they need another receiver. So <laughs> there's a lot to be said. And Gabe Davis is the same way, right? Gabe right. Davis signs in Jacksonville, and they still wanted to bring back Calvin Ridley. So I think every point you made about the market and what's available is absolutely correct. And then if you extend it to tackles, it's almost worse. Yeah. There's only two offensive tackles in this free agent class that signed multi-year contracts to be starters. Mike Unwenu and Jonah Williams. That's it. Mm. Even the other two starting tackles that were signed over the last week or so. Tyron Smith is on a one-year deal with the Jets and Trent Brown is on a one-year deal with the Bengals. So you can make an argument that like five total spots were filled at starting wide receiver and offensive tackle roles in the entire span of free agency, despite how much money was spent over the last two weeks. That's insane. Yeah, that is insane. That, no, it's, and it's a, it's a fantastic point. And again, it matches up with this draft. We're going to see more 
uh, of those two positions drafted in the first round than any other position. And it's just part of it is just coincidence the way it's matching up. But a lot of it is teams want to draft and develop these positions and then hold on to them, extend them and build their build their roster that way. So it, it, it really will be fascinating. If you look at the two teams who really shelled out money for receivers, the Titans had a hundred holes. The Titans had all this money and it was impossible for them to fill every need that they had. So them paying Calvin Ridley so they had a spot to draft a tackle, I can totally understand that, why it makes sense for them. And then the team that signed Jerry Judy after making that deal, they're not picking till 54. So they're Mm -hmm. in a unique situation where they're one of the only teams that in that push and pull of why would we pay Jerry Judy $17 million a year? We can just draft a guy 25th overall. Well, the Browns can't. So even the two teams that did, shell out money for receivers only did so because they were in unique circumstances compared to how most NFL teams are looking at the position right now. Right. The the Judy extension in Cleveland, it's definitely a kind of a head scratcher on on the surface. It's kind of similar what they did with David Njoku, where instead of waiting until his market blows up, let's get the deal done now. And hopefully history looks back at us as, okay, yeah, we made the right move. But yeah, it's, it's, it's looking at a team that, they looked at their wide receiver options. This is a win now team. They're looking at their options and saying, this is this is the best thing we can. This is the best course of action in terms of upgrading our wide receiver depth chart because the drafts, it's it, it's, the, it's a long shot to find a guy like Jerry Judy in the second round of the draft uh, in terms of the money that we can offer and who's available. This is because the draft picks, what, fifth and a sixth round pick. It's all it took to get him. So in terms of everything that the – Browns are dealing with right now in terms of building the best possible roster around the quarterback. This was the best they could do. And, uh, you know, I, I, I give Andrew Barry credit for uh, being having, uh, you know, the guts to do a contract like this. But would I have done it? Probably not. But, uh, you know, it might work out. We'll see. The best comparison to me is what happened with Christian Kirk two years ago. It, mm. There's actually a ton of similarities, even in the way I think Cleveland is conceiving of how he's going to fit with their in their offense. It's like a vertical slot player. Christian mm. Kirk got eighteen million dollars a year two springs ago without ever having a thousand yard season. Jerry Judy got seventeen million dollars a year, is still only twenty four years old, and got less money in a larger, more inflated cap. So right. I think that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to get that sort of deal where it looks crazy based on his production. But if you drop him into a slightly better situation, is that deal actually going to age pretty well? I think there are real questions about that thought process and that strategy, but I think that's ultimately what drove their decision to try to get this done now because the Justin Jefferson deal is coming down the road. The CD lamb deal is coming down the road. So if you can get a guy at 17 million, when the receiver market is now going to be 34 to 35 million, potentially, I think that's what they're trying to get in front of a little bit. So if tackle and receiver were positions that were helped by free agency, which positions do you think were hurt by free agency where enough slots got filled, where maybe some of these guys are going to be pushed a little bit further down the draft. I'm fascinated by the running back market. Uh, We have never seen anything, you know, looking at my, the first day of free agency or first day of tampering and getting updates on my phone, just felt like every other update was a running back. It, it was just crazy to see the mad yeah, dash Swift, of all these teams. Yeah, Swift 10 minutes in is not something I was ready for. <laughs> right. No, exactly. Uh, and, and it's still going. You know, it's still the teams every day are picking up a running back. The volume of guys out there that are available, it's crazy. But, you know, and there's a, a few things here that we can kind of pick apart. First of all, just the sheer number of running backs that are available. I, I think it it speaks to a lot of teams saying, hey, we can find a replacement for you or at least 85, 90% of what we already have with you at a much cheaper price tag. So, and in some cases, maybe upgrades over what we're letting go. Um, I mentioned this on the, on the, our last pod, but you know, there's a good chance we don't have a top 50 running back this year, which would be the second time ever. The only other time was 2014 say uh, with uh, Bishop Sankey. Uh, So it just doesn't happen very often. But with that said, we're going to see a lot of these running backs play off the board round three and round four. But it, it is interesting now with a lot of these, uh, because a lot of teams did sign running backs, but a lot of teams also gave up running backs. And so how does that, you know, it's just kind of like a constant, uh, you know, musical chairs of, okay, we're going to let this one go. But you know what? We've got a lot of fresh running backs coming up through the draft we feel comfortable with. So just the constant movement of the running back market is, is really interesting. 
So let's look at the running backs. I would say that maybe like seven, eight million dollars a year is probably what you would say is like starting level running back money in the NFL right now. Maybe even a little bit less. Maybe if you go to like five or yeah. six. But if you look at the contracts handed out, we said there were five total tackles and receivers that were given starting level contracts in free agency this year. There were six running backs. Josh Jacobs, Saquon Barkley, DeAndre Swift, Tony Pollard, Derek, Devin Singletary, and Derrick Henry all got starting level running back contracts. So there were more running backs signed as starters in free agency than offensive tackles and wide receivers combined, arguably. Wow. And that doesn't include, you know, the Aaron Jones, the, yeah. uh, I mean, like a lot of just quality guys that are going to see close to, if not starter level snaps. So I should yeah, have included Aaron starting. Jones, but the, the total value is a little bit lower. So he was right on my list. So you could argue right. eight. Yeah. That's crazy. That, 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 and it's, I don't, it, it, we haven't seen anything like this. Like this isn't like, I mean, I think it's been building to this, but this is, this is different than we've seen in the past uh, in terms of the office. And, and I don't know that, um, is this going to be what we're going to see every year now? Is this like, uh, is this just a one-off this, this type of running back movement this year? Uh, it will be interesting to track this moving forward. It seems like, I don't know how to characterize it because I'm tempted yeah. to say it was a blip because we're a year removed from Bijan and Jameer Gibbs going in the top 12. But then if you look at what happened after Bijan and Jameer Gibbs, wh who was the next running back that went off the board last year? Charbonnet. Yeah, so Charbonnet was like the second 52 round pick. or something. Yeah, yeah so right. Charbonnet was a second round pick. But after even after Charbonnet, we're talking mostly fourth round guys, right? Tajay Spears, Roshan Johnson. Spears, the guys there was, it was Spears was third. Um, yeah, who uh, Tank was third. Tank, uh, Bigsby. Um, but yeah, uh, Kendra Miller to the Saints. But yeah, for the most That's part, right. yeah, third round. Guys. Yeah, right. But for the most part, yeah. I mean, we we saw there were big gaps there and. In this year's running back class, it's just there's a lot of quality guys, but no true studs, stars. And so there's going to be a run. It's just when's that run start? And you don't want to be first in line necessarily, but you want to be last in line either uh, to get your running back in this draft. Last thing I wanted to ask you before we got out of here. Was there a move or two in free agency, whether it was a trade or a signing, that made you sit back and do the wind horse? Now, why would they do that sort of response? Uh, I mean, the Judy extension, uh, obviously we touched on that. Um, I think not that they traded Justin Fields, but the return, that was certainly mm -hmm. a kind of a, whoa, okay, interesting. That's So that's what the NFL thought. And, you know, I, I know the the Bears got some uh, some criticism for why don't you just hold on to him. And uh, you have players in that locker room openly campaigning for Fields and to you know not draft a quarterback at one when obviously the Bears are drafting a quarterback. Everyone has known they're drafting a quarterback at one for months. You had to trade them. So the Bears did what they had to do. Um, still, this, the return was surprising and disappointing. Um, the Vikings trade, this is interesting because uh, when Kirk Cousins decided to move on to Atlanta, clearly the Vikings shit mind. Their, their thinking shifted to, okay, our next course of action for the quarterback is we're going to go draft one. And we're picking at number 11. We have to figure out how are we going to go up and get our guy. And their first move in that process was to trade picks to move up to pick 23 and have the Texans uh, pick more ammo. So now it becomes interesting. First call to the Patriots, finding out, okay, what's it going to cost to move up there in, in the event that the Patriots are ready to, to do business. Cardinals at four. Chargers at five. Those are your three phone calls now if you're the Vikings to figure out, all right, what's it going to take to go up there? Who's our dance partner going to be? If they can't find a trade partner in those those three picks, three, four, five, then things get really interesting with Minnesota and what they decide to do to make sure they answer their quarterback concerns. And as much as I'd love to still believe in, in Darnold, obviously he is the bridge to whoever they end up drafting. In your the way that you've asked people about this, the digging around that you've done about it, does it seem like it would just be easier to make that move with an extra one than it would be with two twos, even though if you look at any draft chart, the two twos are probably more valuable than the extra one? Like that process and why they would choose to do it incrementally like this, I still don't totally understand it. So I wonder if you've all sniffed right. around on that at all. Yeah, I, I think it's just two ones sound better than uh, a, a one and two twos. I think it's just as simple as that. Even if when you really sit down and think about it, it, I think, I think, and then I think it'll be split uh, depending on who you talk to. Some teams will say, see the value of having multiple twos and what that could be. Um, and it, I think it really depends on what your draft board looks like. If you have, uh, you know, if you feel like those two twos are really third or even fourth round picks on your board, 
then all of a sudden that one is looking pretty nice. And so I, I think it just depends team to team. I don't think there's going to be a, you know, a broad consensus on, on, you know, whether or not that's the right move, but, and it's obviously going to take more than just these two ones, 11 and 23 to move up probably next year's one. If you're the Vikings, you have to add some type of sweetener in there. And is that going to be enough? Pick 11, pick 23, next year's one to move up to three, four or five on the surface, it should be, but it, obviously, again, it takes one of those other teams to trade out of a top 10 that is a strong top 10 draft. Now, you're only trained to 11. You still feel good about the players that are going to be there, but still, it's a big ask, and not every team's going to be comfortable doing that. I'm pretty sure the last time we saw a team make a move from that sort of range, if you go back to 2021, you look at the Niners and the Dolphins. So right. the Niners traded 12 a 2022 first round pick, a 2023 first round pick and a 2022 third round pick. So right. even that required a little bit more than just the three ones. So even if they did 11, 23 and the 2025 first, they still might need to throw something else in there. Alec Lewis, our Vikings writer in their beat writer mock today, it was 11, 23, 2025 first, 2022 sixth is what they okay. eventually settled on which if you look at history it might even require more than those three ones but something you said that i thought was interesting how the patriots deciding to take a quarterback as an owner pick i assume trading out of taking a quarterback is also an owner pick so it's probably easier to go to your owner and say listen we got two ones this year we got a one next year and that's the easier sell rather than here let me show you on the draft chart where the two <laughs> twos are actually more valuable than this other first round pick that's that a great point us. Yes, great point, and that's a that's a good way to frame it because that that's how a lot of a lot of owners, a lot of decision makers will look at it and see the value of a first over having to wait another day to make multiple picks. So yeah, and if you're the Patriots again, you need the picks, you need to build that roster, and so if you're not totally head over heels in love with that third quarterback, then you're going to be open for business. And so uh, that'll, it'll be interesting. Cause again, we still don't know who's going to be two or who's going to be that second quarterback drafted. If it is Jaden Daniels, if it is Drake may, I, I think that if Drake may, if let's just say Jane Daniels goes two to the commanders, I, I think the, the Vikings will probably, I think they would add even a little bit more to go and get May. I, I think that is who they want. And then if they can't get May, I think they are fine with plan B being J.J. McCarthy and what he can be in that offense with Kevin O'Connell. And if I'm May or J.J. McCarthy, I, I'm loving that scenario. I'm fitting in there with Minnesota where I'm not going to be pressed into action from day one. I'm going to be brought along and developed at my own pace. Um, I, so that, that would be an ideal landing spot if I'm one of those two quarterbacks. Something I landed on today that I hadn't previously thought about is that let's say four ends up being the spot where they think that they can trade mm -hmm. up. What did we see the Cardinals do last year? Because I, I assume Cardinals yeah. fans or just general people watching this would say, right. the Cardinals would really trade out when they could get Marvin Harrison Jr. Well, the Cardinals traded out of the top five last year and then traded back right into back. the top 10 to go get Paris Johnson. And it, we've talked about this. If there is a growing, there's a consensus or a thought among some of these teams that there's less of a gap between Marvin Harrison Jr. and the other receivers than maybe people on the outside perceive. The Cardinals trading back to 11 and then maybe trading back up to seven with the Titans or something like that because the Titans think they can get their tackle at 11. That's easily a set of moves that you could see based on need, situation, and previous actions that we've seen so far from that front office. I mean, it is risky because there's a good chance we see, okay, let's say they move up to four and they take the quarterback. Okay, if they believe it's a two-receiver class and receivers go five, six, then, you know, you might lose out on the guy you want at seven. So there is risk involved doing that. But, yeah, I mean, what did uh, Austin Ford, Money Austin Ford, uh, GM, tell us with what he did last year is he is more than willing to be – outside the box with with his thinking in terms of trading around, uh, being creative to get make sure they get the guy that they want, but maybe add a few picks in the process. So, yeah, and, and again, yeah, as much as, I mean, I think Marvin Harrison Jr. is the top receiver in this draft. Nate thinks he's the top receiver in this draft. A lot of people do. It's not a consensus. And even if you think that he is the top receiver, if you have Malik Neighbors biting at his heels right there with him, if you have the chance to add some more draft picks in the process, then I can understand why you would choose a Malik Neighbors plus a little bit extra over going Marvin Harrison Jr. So that I think that is part of the conversation. And, and something else I wanted to mention too is if 
let's just say Drake May, people are going crazy with this. If let's just say Drake May goes two to the Commanders, what are the chances that JJ McCarthy is the third quarterback drafted? Is that possible? If you're say, let's just say you're the Vikings. Okay? I think it's absolutely possible. I, so do I, and I think people will lose their mind over that when they when they hear this. But if uh, okay, let's just say yeah, May goes two, and the Patriots they wanted May. They they're not they're not Jaden Daniels, and this is hypothetical, but they don't want Jaden Daniels. Um, so they trade out of there. Vikings go up to three, and they feel good about JJ McCarthy over Jaden Daniels. That's certainly a realistic scenario, and that's something where again, there's no consensus order with these quarterbacks. Uh, everyone looks at them a little bit differently, and that's important for people to keep in mind. And that's not just it's personality fit, it's scheme fit, it's it's everything. So. Let's not just – it's not the top three quarterbacks. It's the top four quarterbacks. And if it gets jumbled a little bit along the way, it, I don't think it should surprise many people. What I want to see is – and this is going really far down the rabbit hole here. I want to see Arizona move back from four to 11 and then trade back up to five. So in actuality, all they did yeah. was drop back one pick. But because a team is going to pay a tax to come up for a quarterback, I would almost yeah. guarantee that when you're done with that set of moves, you're going to come out in the black – with the draft capital that you added. And again, we've seen them be created before, and we know that the Chargers have been vocal about potentially wanting to trade down. So yeah. I think we could see some wild movement in the top 10 of the likes that we have not seen in quite a long time. That That's a great point. I think that's that's a an interesting and very realistic scenario because of the reasons you said. The Chargers won out of there. They want more picks. Uh, the Cardinals have the upper hand because they pick first uh, between those two picks. And, yeah, I, I, I would. It, that's good. We're going to see some action in the top ten. There's no question about it. It's just where does it happen and what is the ripple effect? You know, there's going to be a domino effect based off of that first trade and how the quarterbacks play out. And so that's what's going to make the, the first round a lot of fun. And I'm, I'm glad we're going to be doing a doing it live so people can enjoy it with us. Uh, that you just spoiled it for people, but we are oh, going I? to do a live draft show again this year. Hopefully from Detroit. Still having some details ironed out, but no matter what. We are going to be coming to you guys live during round one of the draft for round, year three with you, year four overall, yeah. I, I think is how long we've been doing this. We there's I don't know if there's actual footage that exists of the first one that Nate and I did from that hotel room in Chicago where we filmed. I, I need your Justin Fields reaction. Oh, that, that was that was that draft, right? That was that draft. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. You know what? I still stand by it in the moment. I still think <laughs> oh. it was the right reaction. Sure. Oh, absolutely. I, I, yeah, it's it's not that it aged poorly. It's just it's in the moment. That's that's what it was. Absolutely. I I can't even tell you how nice it is to need a quarterback and know who that quarterback is going to be and where you're going to get it. The fact that Keenan Allen was Keenan at oh Caleb Williams is pro yeah. day. Can you remember anything like that? No, that that one was that's surprising. Um, I mean, I've seen a lot of things at pro days. I remember going to see Johnny Manziel's pro day and. Uh, President Bush was there. I mean, I, I've seen some crazy things at pro days, but no, that I, and you know, he's in LA obviously being, you yeah. know, formerly of the Chargers. So like it's in, in the bears were spent a lot of time in, in LA. So they probably met with Keenan and, you know, it was one of those things where it just kind of worked out. It probably didn't take a lot of uh, planning to make it happen, but yeah, just the fact that he was there. And uh, I mean, that it, it is, uh, it's pro days for quarterbacks. Don't really, I, I think they're kind of useless uh, in terms of the, the player the reason why a lot of teams go to these pro days uh for quarterbacks is the person they want to see how you interact with these guys they want to see uh just how you carry yourself and yeah i don't I, the bears are certainly uh they're, they're not hiding their interest in caleb williams and you know not hiding from the fact that they that's the clear favorite for what's going to happen so um yeah I, it's a much different look at this quarterback situation than what bears fans are used to yeah, we, we've had some different treatments of number one overall quarterbacks over the past few years, including the Jags pretending that Trevor Lawrence was yeah. not the starter for half of training camp. Does not seem like the Bears are going to be going down that same road. Yeah. Dane Brugler, thank you very much for the time, my friend. I know you've got a million things going on. For everyone, just a heads up, the Beast is coming in it early is. April. It will be on its way. It will be available on The Athletic. It is the preeminent draft guide in this industry. The amount of work that Dane puts into it and just how exhaustive every look at pretty much every draftable player in this class is. There is no other resource in this space like it. So be prepared to be on the lookout for that when it drops here in a few weeks. I know you are hard at work on that thing right now. Yep, just trying to keep up. We got we're we're counting down the days. So we're under two weeks now, um, which is crazy. So we're uh, 
We'll, we'll get there. So I always fret this time of year because it's, it looks like we're not going to get it done, but we always find a way, and, and this year will be the same thing, type of thing. So Always appreciate it, buddy. We will talk to you next Thursday with me, you, and Nate. We're going to be yep. breaking down the quarterbacks in earnest that day. Until then, enjoy your weekend. We'll talk to you soon.